Thank you very much um, for the invite to this um, meeting. And I'm going to give an overview of clustering and moving on to model-based clustering and applications. And it's going to be a very kind of historical kind of development of um, clustering um, and a very general overview. I think I have one slide that has equations in the entire talk. So um, hopefully that's OK. So the idea of um, grouping objects according to kind of being similar to each other, which is what clustering is, goes back all the way to the origins of language, where we tend to use the same word to describe multiple objects that have something in common with each other using um, things like nouns. So the noun, for example, the word hammer, is used to describe multiple objects that actually have a similar attributes um, in common, and we might even call that attribute just um, they all have a long handle and they have a heavy head and they're used for um, basically um, hammering objects into whatever situation they're being used in. This was actually formalized um, as long ago as um, by Plato, Plato in his theory of forms, um, where he defined a form as an abstract unchanging object um, of which there are many instances in practice. So the clustering actually goes back a long way, and it was even formalized um, as long ago as the ancient Greeks. Um, moving more towards what we would consider to be clustering nowadays, um, Aristotle actually started to classify um, animals according to kind of data, measured characteristics of these. So it was very much an empirical um, um, development of clustering when Aristotle tried to classify um, animals into groups um, based on various measured characteristics. And one of his students did the same thing then with plants in an inquiry to plants. So clustering actually has a very um, long history going back um, all the way to the ancient Greeks where we were doing empirical clustering. One of the most famous clusterings that came out then after that was when Linnaeus decided to systematically group um, living species into um, clusters um, or a taxonomy um, in his two books, Species Planetarium and Species Nature. So clustering has been going on a long time and Linnaeus in particular, when he was classifying plants, he classified plants into 24 different clusters based on their reproductive system. So, and there's a very nice um, illustration of this um, showing the diff um, a representation of each cluster, basically of his 24 clusters um, of plants um, in um, his work. So moving on much closer to the present, we're still a long way in the past. Um, cluster analysis started to really get developed um, from the early 1900s onwards. So Chekhanowski developed measures of similarity between objects and used these in anthropology. Um, Tryon in 1939 actually produced a textbook um, about cluster analysis. So um, that was the first book about cluster analysis that um, came out. And then in the 1950s, there was just an explosion of interest in clustering in the area of biology and numerical taxonomy. Um, and a number of commonly used clustering methods that we hear about nowadays, like single linkage clustering, average linkage clustering, um, complete linkage clustering, all came out from this period in the 1950s where there was just an explosion of interest in this. All of these methods fall into what's called hierarchical clustering, that we start out with every individual being separate from each other, and then we successively merge um, the most similar um, clusters um, to reduce the number of clusters by one. And this made a lot of sense in biological applications where the hierarchical clustering may represent some sort of hierarchy or ev even evolutionary um, structure in the data. So um, that was kind of a whole area of um, clustering that kind of came out in the 1950s. I'm getting closer to model-based clustering now, but when we Another very, very popular clustering method to this day that's used, and I'm actually going to demonstrate its use in a second um, on an um, illustrative example, was k-means clustering, which was an idea that came up in multiple papers in the late 60s and early 70s. So you hear people refer to it as Lloyd's algorithm, the Queen's algorithm, the Hartigal and Wall algorithm. And the idea of k-means clustering is 
you start off by basically choosing some prototype cluster centers. So you decide these are my three, or if I was doing three clusters, these are my prototype cluster centers. Then you put your observations into whatever cluster um, they're closest to, and then you update your cluster centers, and then you reallocate your observations, you update your cluster centers, and you iterate until your solution converges. Um, and it can work very well in practice. Um, and basically, it's used very, very widely. I'm going to demonstrate this um, on a, a local example. So here's a picture of um, somewhere in Cambridge. Um, and this is an image that has um, about 700,000 pixels in it. So if you take this image, every pixel consists of a red, green, and a blue value. And your computer mixes those three colors together and produces a dot of that color. So if we take this image and just treat this as a data set that has each pixel has three values, red, green, and blue, and we run clustering on it, in particular k-means, what's going to happen? So there's 700,000 unique pixels, and each takes um, three values. And I, this is a nice analogy of, say, treating every pixel as being different, the 700,000 unique ones, um, and we'll go all the way down to um, clustering them and see what we actually find. So if we run a one cluster model, so we take each pixel and we replace it by whatever cluster mean it belongs to, we get a very boring gray image. So it's like if you looked out your window on a foggy morning in Cambridge, you might see this, and this is what um, the average of that image looks like. As soon as we start clustering the pixels into more than one um, cluster, we actually start, start to see some interesting structure. So when we do a two cluster um, solution, we actually just get dark and light um, pixels. And it's actually not a bad picture, even at that stage. So we've replaced the 700,000 unique values with just two values. So that image is colored with just two values. When we got to go to three, it's actually kind of looking even better. We have dark, light, and somewhere in between. And it kind of even looks like an old fashioned kind of photo you might find sometimes in a bookshop or something as a postcard. When we get to 20 clusters, I did actually run all the way up to 100, but at 20 clusters, there's very little difference between um, the original image and what we're actually getting. So we've replaced the 700,000 unique pixel values by just 20 unique pixel values. So each pixel has been replaced by whatever cluster mean that it belongs to. And you can see that we've um, got an image that does not look that different from the original. So that's something that um, clustering gives us. It gives us a way of kind of refining, having everybody being unique down to a small number of prototype um, individuals um, or pixels in this case. And that's um, something that we can be quite useful um, to do. And it's a nice example of it. I tend to work on cluster analysis methods that are based on statistical models. So rather than being algorithmic, all the methods I talked about so far, at least initially, look like they're algorithmic. Their statistical properties have been studied extensively, and we have some idea about what models they um, roughly correspond to when we're fitting them. Um, there's two nice quotes that I tend to use, in particular the first one um, when I'm trying to explain um, the model-based clustering approach. This is from a paper in Journal of the Royal Statistical Society Series A from 1981 by Murray Aitken and co-authors. And they had a nice quote in the discussion of that paper where they say, when clustering samples from a population, no cluster model is a priori believable without a statistical model. So it's very easy to sit down and come up with an algorithm like k-means that kind of feels like it makes sense. But can we really understand what the algorithm is doing without a statistical model? A more recent um, quote from the bioinformatics literature basically mentions that if we go down the statistical modeling route, it also, we have the whole inference machinery available to us to help us decide how many clusters, what are the clusters, et cetera. So it opens up a whole um, set of machinery for actually trying to establish whether we've got good results with our clustering or not. Um, I have a tendency to throw um, one or both of these quotes into grant applications, and it seems to go down well with reviewers. So that's just some advice um, if you're doing this. So when did model-based clustering start? 
So the first um, paper really that successfully implemented a model-based clustering approach was the latent class analysis model by Paul Lazarsfeld. So this is for clustering um, multivariate categorical um, variables. So it's in the 1950s, um, Lazarsfeld um, developed latent class analysis. Um, and interestingly, he used the terminology manifest variables for the observed values and latent variables um, for the unknown cluster allocations. And this is one of the first uses of the word latent variable in the statistics literature. And you may ask, why did Paul Lazarsfeld use that terminology? Um, Paul Lazarsfeld's mother, Sophie, was a psychologist, and she was of the Austrian training. And there's a very famous psychologist in Austria who talked um, about latent dreams and manifest dreams. Um, and basically, so the terminology that we use latent variables and manifest variables in some areas of statistics, in particular in the social sciences, they still sometimes use manifest, um, can be traced back to um, Sigmund Freud, basically, um, which is something that's surprising to learn. Um, quite often people are clustering continuous data and the kind of first successful approach for doing model-based clustering for continuous data was by um, was by um, Wolf, John Wolf, and it was actually in his master's thesis in Berkeley in the 1960s. And his work is clearly very inspired by what Paul Lazarsfeld did. Um, he actually attended a course that Lazarsfeld gave in Berkeley um, while he was a student there. And he used um, a multivariate um, Gaussian mixture model for doing model-based clustering. It's also worth mentioning that, oh, sorry, uh, that Wolf had open source software called Normix that he made available even as early as the 1960s and early 70s for um, doing this model-based clustering. Um, so how does model-based clustering actually work? So it's going to give us a systematic framework for clustering data, as I said. Um, we're going to assume that, I'm going to assume at least in my talk, that the observations come from what's called a finite mixture model. There are model-based clustering approaches that allow for what are called infinite mixture models or non-parametric um, kind of models. So I'm going to assume that there are capital G groups, clusters, classes, or components, whatever you want to call them. It seems to vary depending on the domain you're working in. So that's the number of clusters. The probability that an observation comes from group little g is given by the value tau g, so that's a probability between 0 and 1, and obviously the probability across all the groups adds to 1. And then the key power of model-based clustering is we're going to model data that comes from group little g using some statistical model, and that model will be chosen to capture the structure of the data that we're interested in. So if you think about the Lazarsfeld approach, he assumed kind of Bernoulli random variables that were conditionally independent. Um, the John Wolfe's model-based clustering assumed a multivariate Gaussian. But you can make a, choose a model that's kind of bespoke for the application that you're considering and can capture the complex structures in the data that you're actually looking for, like in the previous talk, where we were looking at complex dependencies between um, different outcomes. And then, Using the kind of standard laws of probability, we, we can bring the different components of the model together and we get something called a mixture model. So we basically mix these individual um, component densities together using the weights that tell us how prevalent each group is to come up with an overall group uh, model for the data. And then we can um, fit that model to the data either using classical maximum likelihood approaches or Bayesian approaches and learn a lot about um, the population that we're interested in. And we can use the tools of inference to decide how many groups we need um, and what. And the nice thing about this approach then is the probability, the component densities, give us a way of characterizing what we expect to see within each group, which is a nice um, feature that comes from this. I've done a lot of work on um, Gaussian mixture models, and in particular, um, the m cluster family of models, which is a family of models that basically gives us a lot of flexibility when we're modeling continuous data. Um, we have generic software available called MCLUST that is very um, heavily used and um, has been downloaded a lot um, from 
the comprehensive OR um, network over the last few years. Um, what we did is we took the multivariate Gaussian model, and if you're assuming your data comes from a multivariate Gaussian, it means that your clusters of points follow an elliptical shaped cluster. Um, and then we kind of have a number of constraints that we can allow for the clusters. Um, we have three letters in our, we have 14 models, and there's three letters associated with each model. The first one says, do the clusters occupy the same volume? So when you plot the points, is, there, is the scatter kind of equal, shape, equal sized volume? So that's what the first letter, E means it's equal, mean, B means it's variable. The second letter um, looks at the, uh, the shape of the cluster. Are the ellipses the same shape or not? And the last letter looks at the orientation. So do the clusters tend to point in the same way or not? This allows us massively reduce the number of um, potential parameters in our model and allows us fit the models um, in a more flexible way um, to larger data sets than we might not otherwise be able to do. And it's been shown to work very well in um, a huge range of application um, domains. So that's kind of general clustering work that we did. Moving on to some more specific applications that we've been working on over the last few years. Um, I, was, I did an application with some um, collaborators basically in Ireland where we had data that was collected in St. James's Hospital in Dublin. And we had data from a cohort of patients with early onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, and for each um, patient, we had a binary outcome variable whether they had the presence or absence of hallucination, activity, aggression, agitation, diurnal, and effective. So they're, they're kind of overall summaries I've kind of summarized quite briefly there. And the medics wanted to look at these patients. They felt classifying all the patients as a single group was not um, the correct thing to do. So they felt there were subgroups of patients within this early onset Alzheimer's uh, cohort and they wanted um, to see how many groups there were. And they had a good hunch that there was either two or three groups of patients. Now I'm gonna show you the results in a single plot. This is um, a mosaic plot of the results. So the vertical axis is broken into three bands. We, we felt there were three groups of patients. The size of the vertical bar tells you how prevalent that group is. So that's showing the tau values for that cluster. And then, so we've got two groups that are very prevalent and then one very, very small group, group that is very, very low prevalence, that third cluster. And then the color of the bar is giving the probability that somebody has presence on that um, feature. So we can see, for example, for the aggression one, we have a group of patients that have a very low probability of having aggression, a medium, and then a very, that small group has a very high probability of having aggression. Um, in contrast, that group has very low um, probability of agitation. Um, and you can see basically the presence and absence, the probability of presence or absence of each of the symptoms in each of the groups. So it felt like there were three groups, and then this is showing the probability um, of presence or absence of each of these symptoms. And that was interesting. And you could see why there was a bit of a debate between two or three clusters, because that third cluster seems to have very, very low prevalence. Um, the probability of it is very low and it could easily be missed. And we've applied lots of different model-based clustering approaches and it always seems to point that that group is actually there. Um, from a different Dublin hospital, St. Vincent's Hospital, um, near the university I work in, um, I had a physiotherapist come to me one time with a data set that he had collected um, on lower back pain. And again, it's another binary data set. Um, where basically he had 36 different binary um, indicators, presence or absence of different clinical features of lower back pain. Now this physiotherapist was, had a lot of statistical training. He'd been running Bayesian logistic regression, Bayesian model averaging, et cetera. So it was really easy to work with him. Um, but he had this idea basically, I'm gonna give you this data set and I want you to look for clusters in it. I know the physiotherapists feel that there are three different groups in this data, but I'm not going to tell you that for the moment. So the current taxonomy of um, patients within physiotherapy was that there's no susceptive back pain, peripheral neuropathic and central synthesization. 
but I want you to analyze the data kind of not using that information and see what you find. Do we get the same results as what the clinicians think or not? Um, so we ran a number of clustering methods and we came up with a way of trying to do feature selection and clustering simultaneously for categorical data. Um, and basically the results is we found you can cluster the patients. We've got three clusters um, based on a small number of the um, features that were recorded for the patients. Um, and again, this is a similar heat map where the color shows you the probability of presence and absence. And if you look at this, because we've done feature selection, if you look down any of the columns here, you can see there's a change in color. So these are the fe these features um, allowed us to separate the patients into different groups quite effectively. Here's some text around what the features are and the probabilities and the observed counts. But an example of this would be, say, for example, one of the features was clear and consistent pain proportion of pattern or pain. And it's very high in two of the clusters. Um, you have 97 and 94% probability of it, and then very low in the last one. There's one to do with sleep further up as well. You can see night pain disturbs sleep. It's medium, high, and high. So we've got, we're able to um, kind of understand what the groups are that we found here. And our results correspond quite closely to what the clinicians actually felt for the groups. But Keith was particularly interested in this group, that there's a group of patients here that we are putting in with the peripheral neuropathic, but the clinicians had diagnosed as no susceptible to lower back pain. And the reason for that, it turns out after the event, is the clinicians were asked to diagnose the primary pain category, and sometimes these two pain groups actually occur together. So maybe you know you could argue that's why you're getting this kind of what looks like we're getting the wrong diagnosis or the wrong classification for those patients in that case it's because the patients actually had the presence of two different types of back pain more um moving to a slightly different application domain um but continuing on the area of kind of um clustering and choosing features to help define the clusters um, a former student of mine, Michael Fopp, and I were looking at data from the human mortality database, where we took the human mortality database has mortality curves from lots of countries from lots of different time periods, um, all the way up to the present. So for each country, we take the mortality curve, which is giving basically the probability of dying in um, the near future, basically, is, to put it in a very simple way, for multiple countries over time. And when we clustered these um, mortality curves um, using model-based clustering, where we also did feature selection, we found um, five clusters of mortality curves. And typically the clusters are really being driven by the fact um, that countries are typically improving in mortality um, over time. So we found that even though there are lots of different mortality curves for different countries, you could actually classify them into about five different um, groups. And the differences between the countries has really been driven largely by the um, zero to 49, the early age mortality um, experience. When I say typically countries tend to improve, you do get some interesting effects in World War II and in Eastern Bloc European countries that things kind of don't quite necessarily follow um, that mortality keeps improving over time. Um, and that's some interesting results that we found in that data. More recently, when I was on sabbatical last year in France, we were looking at all cause mortality in the different departments in France in the first two years of the pandemic compared to prior to the pandemic. So we had kind of some adjustment for that. And we found that when you cluster the mortality experience um, during the pandemic in France, we got six clusters. Um, the departments in France fell into six different clusters. Now you may ask, but your map only has four clusters in it. Um, France has a number of overseas clusters or overseas departments. So Martinique and Guadeloupe ended up in a cluster on their own and Guyane and Mayotte ended up in a cluster on their own. Um, reunion actually ended up in the green cluster. And the results made a lot of sense. I was in Lyon at the time. This is one of the clusters. Um, Paris and the Grand Est ended up together. And then you get kind of lower um, density population areas also fell into clusters on their own. Um, and you get some interesting results about. Um, so that's kind of another example where clustering um, simplified the results. 
One last study I just want to briefly mention that I did with uh, a colleague and a student of mine and um, Raffaella Picoretta in Bocconi University in um, Milan. We were looking at career trajectories of young males. So this is kind of another demography type application in Northern Ireland. Um, and so in this case, your data is sequences of careers. And when we clustered the cohort of young males, um, we had what job were they doing every three months after they finished high school, basically. And you get some interesting um, patterns where you have, say, for example, a group of males that are in training after they finish school and then they end up in employment. You get people that end up in training, um, they end up jobless, back in training and then jobless again. Um, so you get these different career trajectories of individuals over time, rather than looking at each person individually, when we cluster them, we start to see some interesting kind of um, trajectories that people um, had. We also have some clusters where the pattern is kind of the same, but the timing is different. These people spent a short length of time training and then ended up in employment. These people spent a long time in training and um, then ended up in employment, for example. If you want to learn more about model-based clustering, um, I have a book that's actually out with Cambridge University Press um, that I wrote with three other co-authors. Um, it's available online in PDF if you want to um, look at it. And then more recently, I have the book that was mentioned in my introduction where we have um, about model-based clustering using the M plus package specifically um, and going through all of, the all of the functionality of that package. So thank you. And I hope that was an okay. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, hold on, just let me give you. Thanks, for a fascinating talk. I'm interested to know what you the image of Cambridge data. Uh, which uh, justify came in how your M class uh, uh, would perform, it's... and uh, and uh, just follow up. Uh, I would be curious, like you have a you leave the data as a benchmark so we can play around. And uh, the second question is uh, which aspect you are still under development uh, uh, improvement with the M class itself? Thank you. So. So the first question, N plus actually does fairly similar. Like I just demonstrated the results for numbers of clusters. We could have we could have actually used M plus to tell us how many clusters we actually need. One of the M plus models, the EII model, is really, really similar to K-means clustering. You can actually write down um, if you take the EII model and make a tiny extra assumption that all of the groups have the same probability. That is effectively k-means, uh, or at least if you try to fit that model, you're. I could actually, if you don't use the, yeah, it is effectively k-means. If you make the tau g's are the same for all the groups, and you assume our EII assumption, you effectively get k-means clustering, which is a nice thing to know because it gives us an idea of when is k-means clustering going to work and when is k-means clustering not going to work um, to some extent, and you can actually see that when you know that connection between the two models. Um, the other question was about the development of M plus going forward. Um, we're always thinking, like we actually now are, we kind of collect things that we're thinking of adding um, going forward. Like one thing we have some stuff in is, um, some people want to have weights. We have some functionality where you can weight your observations, they don't count um, equally. And we're developing that at the moment. We've all, we've also just like it's constantly doing Bayesian model averaging. I did some work where we use Bayesian model averaging with M plus. Maybe incorporation that could be happening going forward. But it's it's constantly we're thinking about ways that it needs to be developed. Um, so I, I know I've only partially answered that. Was there a middle question as well? Uh, I'm just curious. If you made a benchmark data for the camera image. You'd be interested to play around. Yeah. Oh, I'm happy to share the code or image for that. Like yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's there isn't a ground truth, like it's just this is how it works. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
Um, thank, thanks for a wonderful talk. And, and thank you so much for mentioning Plato and Freud in a statistics talk. That's the first time I've ever heard that <laughs> and really wonderful. Um, I've used mclus a lot and I, and I like it a lot. I had a question. So when I do clustering, I sometimes struggle with um, with collaborators as well, when when we can kind of trust the results of the clustering. And I, I think you, you alluded to this a bit in some of your applications, but do you have any thoughts about kind of how we know we can trust the results of clustering? And also kind of more broadly, what role do you see clustering as playing in kind of the broader scientific method? What, what, where do you see the kind of function of, of, of this in, 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 the, in the broader context? It's the, the first question about how do we trust the clustering is very tricky. Um, and in particular, it, it can get very, as people have made their component distributions more and more complex, myself included, it becomes an even more difficult problem. Because sometimes you can have multiple aspects of the model competing to describe what's actually happening. So an example of this, I've done a lot of work where you have kind of latent factor models that have clustering as well. And the latent factors and the clusters are both competing to describe the dependency in the data. So you could add a load of factors, you get a great model, add a load of clusters, you get a great model. So you're trying to get the balance between the two sometimes. Um, it is quite tricky. And sometimes you can convince yourself that you have too many clusters. Um, and there was an interesting example of that a few years ago where we thought that initially and we were completely wrong. So a few years ago, I did some work with Francois Caron and UAT in Oxford, and we were clustering Irish student college applications. And we were using some, non, some Bayesian non-parametric model. Um, and we had one cluster that had seven individuals in it. It was either seven or nine, like 50, 56,000 um, observations and a cluster with seven individuals. And they were like, this is just noise. And I said, send me the seven individuals. And it was really obvious to me that these were seven very distinct individuals. They didn't all have the exact same observations, but it was very clear to me that these were seven individuals that their career ambition in life was to become a home economics teacher. Um, and they were choosing various college degrees that would make them become a, you know, um, a home economics teacher. Now, the interesting thing about that is like, so it wasn't overfishing. We just found this very, very niche group of individuals. Um, quite often I find I actually have to present the results of more than one clustering because you kind of go, I think this is the best clustering, but this one is actually almost as good, you know? So sometimes there's a bit of confidence there. Like, you know, you have a criterion that tells you um, but sometimes you just kind of go, but it is something, and actually just to mention that very small cluster, that was one thing that these Bayesian non-parametric methods are very good at finding. They tend to be biased towards finding really big clusters and really small clusters, where maybe the fi finite mixture approach tends to be more balanced. The finite mixture approach would have missed that group of individuals, um, just to mention that, where the Bayesian non-parametric method. Thank you. Yeah. We, oh. I was to say, we just have one quick question yeah. from Fenny online. Fenny, can you unmute yourself and say your question, please? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Thank you for the nice presentation. So I'm only wondering if in this M class, uh, we have some kind of function which uh, we can like cluster our data, but condition conditional on the situation where we want to fix uh, the proportion of the subjects or data in the, in those clusters? Um, it's not in there directly. Um, it actually would be, maybe that's something that needs to be added to MCLUST. It would not be that difficult to actually do that. Like the mathematics and the code would be very um, simple to do. The there is a there is a package quite like mclust um, called or mixmod that a, a group of French researchers have implemented, and they have the option of having equal groups. But I don't know if they allow you to specify other than equal. But it could it would it would be not that difficult to maybe make mclust do that. Um, but it's not in there by default. So if you did want to contact me after the event, I could possibly 
point how you could do that. Ah, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry, great talk. I just wondered for M Clust, what scares you most? The N, the number of people, the D, the dimension, or the K, the number of clusters? Um, all, well, all of the above. <laughs> so M Clust works okay for moderate dimensional data. Um, the thing about Gaussian mixture models um, is the number of parameters grows quadratically with D, the dimensionality of the data. And yes, some of the M plus models um, have very few parameters. They only grow linearly with D, but those models assume conditional independence between the features. So um, D is probably the one that scares me the most, um, but there are other approaches, say, based on kind of mixture of factor analyzers type models that actually work quite well um, in that context. So I've done some work on kind of mixture of factor analyzers. There's um, some of my collaborators have a nice approach um, where actually you can have, um, it's called IMIFA, um, infinite mixtures of infinite factor analyzers, um, which is actually based on some work that David um, did a few years ago, kind of applying that in. So that kind of gets you, that those factor models at least allow you to have non-trivial covariance matrices um, in high dimensions D. Some people say that M plus doesn't scale very well with N. Um, M plus is a very clever way of starting the algorithm for fitting the mixture. That part of the algorithm is very poor as N gets large, but there are ways around that. Um, and you can always run it on a subset and kind of update the results after. Um, G, I suppose what, what, what scares me about K or G, the number of groups or clusters, is if you have a lot of data, you have enough information to go, well, this group is not Gaussian, and then M plus might start to put multiple kind of Gaussians that are very similar to each other to try and capture some sort of non-Gaussian effect. Um, so all of them worry me, um, but I'd say D, for M plus, D is probably the one that worries me the most, but there are ways, other, there are alter alternatives. I probably am starting to worry about K a bit more because as our data sets that we're collecting get larger and larger, you have enough information to go, your component density um, is, you know, the assumption on your component density is clearly not 100% correct. And then you start kind of getting much higher K than you'd actually believe is actually plausible. Um, so all of them worry me, but that's kind of my answer. Is it? Hi, thanks for a yep. really clear and interesting talk. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on what you think is best practice for communicating the uncertainty in the number of clusters, particularly when dealing with clinicians who often like a single answer in my experience. Um, so one thing I have done when I've been doing this is BIC, at least to some, to some very crude approximation, you can actually turn a BIC into a very crude estimate of a posterior probability. So you can actually, in M plus, if you took all of the BIC values, half them and exponentiated them and then made them add up to one, like divided, that gives you at least some idea of, it's a very crude posterior probability. So you're saying, okay, we think the three cluster results are the best, um, and the model says there's a 68% probability that there's three clusters and a 20% probability of two, you know, so you do get, um, but I think that's where some of the more modern Bayesian methods, I think, really start to help where you can actually give a more accurate posterior probability for the number of groups. Um, I think that's one way of trying to communicate the number, the uncertainty. The other one is sometimes I do show them, here's the three cluster results, but this is what happens when you go to two, this is what you, you know, try and kind of show them that. I think the image analysis example shows you that as you cha change K, you're just zooming in a bit more or zooming out a bit more. And you could think of the number of clusters you're using as how fine grained a view of the population do I want to take? And that's one way I actually, you know, justify the results as well to them. So you could zoom in more, or you could zoom out more, and you know, I think this is the best overall summary. Okay, yeah, just one yeah. more question. So, um, yeah, Ayab say online, could you please um, unmute and say your question, please? Yeah, thank you. 
just I was wondering, first of all, thank you for nice talk and experience sharing for us, with us. Just one question. I mean, how, you know, the adjustment for covariate or, you know, your group probability and also other yeah. part of the model, how does it affect? I mean, I'm pretty sure you have done that one, but how does it change, you know, number of cluster and so on? And also one, what is similarity between this fixed source out of the number of cluster with confirmatory factor analysis and explanatory factor analysis? There's some sort of connections there, I believe. Thank you. So for covariates, there has been some work. It's probably an area where there's a lot work, a lot more work need to be, needs to be done. So traditionally, what a lot of people did is they just ran their cluster analysis and then they did an exploratory analysis of, oh, this cluster tends to be dominated by males. This cluster tends to be dominated by older people, um, et cetera. They just did an exploratory analysis where they took the cluster labels as factors and then just did exploratory analysis. There is a whole family of models that has appeared under multiple guises, but probably got unified into quite a nice kind of framework called mixture of experts models um, in the machine learning literature, where you can have covariates influence your mixing proportions, the tau's in my notation, and enter your component densities. Um, and there has been a lot of work on that over the last few years. Um, I did some work with a student a few years ago where we did bring covariates into the n plus family of models. Um, I think the, there's an R package called Mo Clust, Mixture of Experts Clust, that basically does this. But where the covariates enter the model does actually matter. Um, it does change, it really changes the interpretation of the cluster. Um, it, once, you, once you start bringing covariates in, because it's kind of like the clustering is capturing what the covariates can't capture to some extent in a lot of cases. Um, so you have to spend a bit of time thinking about what you're getting because it's, it's um, but it can be done and there is a nice framework that kind of was put together in machine learning by um, Zubin Garamani and, and some other people that has done very well. Um, um, so that's basically, there, it is possible. Um, I think that's. Okay. I think we have one Thank question, you. and then we can um, head off for lunch. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very interesting and informative talk. Um, I have a very, I don't know, maybe a naive question. Um, but I once did a clustering project too um, in a pharmaceutical company. And in the end, they are not just interested in the cluster. Okay, I see three clusters. They're more interested in. Um, how, what are the boundaries that you define the cluster? For example, the, this cluster has people have younger age or higher blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera. And we try so many different ways. And every time the cluster we found, it is against the intuitions and experiences of the medical experts. And in the end, nobody believed this work. <laughs> so I wonder, have you ever experienced something similar and how would you cope with such situations? Thank you. Um. I haven't had huge amount of resistance. Like I, I suppose I haven't had exactly the situation you're saying where the medics didn't believe the clusters. Um, I did once have a situation related close, but it turned out it turned out the clustering found something that actually had gone wrong. Basically, um, we were doing a study on prostate cancer. Um, we were measuring not new biomarkers that had been proposed, and we had data from Ireland. Austria and Australia. Um, it was a multi kind of site um, study. And we were getting absolutely awful results. <laughs> um, nothing was working. And eventually, actually, when I, at some stage, I just said, let's cluster the data. And it turned out the clusters ended up being Ireland, Austria, and Australia, not prostate cancer and not. And it turned out actually that one of the chemicals that our suppliers, a buffer, for the reactions that one of the suppliers had supplied had been out of date um, when we were analyzing the Irish samples. And that actually, you know, but it is something that I haven't encountered and I can imagine it's quite difficult. You can have the opposite as well. Um, and actually the back pain study might be a good example of that. So when we, when we originally analyzed the back pain data, just using latent class analysis, 
no variable selection, et cetera. I think we found like seven clusters um, and they were nested within. So it looked like it was gonna be a great discovery that no susceptive has two subclasses, peripheral neuropathic has three and central synthesization has two subclasses. But I think, and we, of course, we started trying to interpret them and kind of, it's the opposite of what you're saying. They really wanted, oh, this is really amazing discovery. But then we found really those clusters were being driven by the modeling assumptions more than the actual data. Um, so you can have both, you can have, you can't convince the doctors that the clusters are real. And then you can have the opposite that you find clusters that you're not so sure they're really clusters, but they want to interpret them as clusters. And you want to too, because you're going, oh, we found something amazing. Um, it, what I said, it wasn't quite true. There was certain tiny differences, like it was to do with the, how the patients were responding to um, basically taking NSAIDs. Like there was maybe some very subtle effect a larger study might have found, but they really wanted the seven cluster solution because they were going with, so it can happen both ways. People can over interpret their clusters or they just don't believe the clusters. Yeah. <clears throat>